It's either treating it like a bacteria. Huh? I found this on the stairs. Oh, what? From this position, she could barely see into the development room. Oh, nope. It is someone. Oh, no. How's it going, everybody? Hoodlumut here, back with some more Steins Gate Zero. And uh, last time, Maho uh, found that there was some evil afoot. Or at least what we're perceiving that way so far. There's something nefarious or i don't know that's the wording i want to use maybe it's not nefarious maybe maybe it's more like it's something that they didn't want to tell her we'll keep it at that for now uh but it seems like it's not a good thing based off of uh the the little very vague information we were gathering but they wanted to use okabe to try and and what was it get something out of him right they wanted to try and and find out I believe it, it, it's insinuating they wanted to find out about him time traveling, probably, right? So that can't be good, right? I mean, it's it's most obviously nefarious. Um, but also, we uh, we helped Mayuri get uh, some different materials for, I believe, what were flyers or some something of the nature for Okabe's family's. Uh, business, which I guess they have, um, and so we went and helped her do that, and uh, and then while we were there, we got a little message from Kade, or Mayuri did, that said Fubuki was back in the hospital for some reason. So uh, now we're here, so let's just uh, let's just get into it. Fubuki was at a different location than before. This time, it was the. A.H. Tokyo General Hospital High Tech Medical Center in Yoyogi. Jeez, that's a mouthful. It was supposedly one of Japan's most advanced hospitals. According to what I read on the internet, patients with the new encephalitis that everyone was talking about were being gathered here for special treatment. Ah, uh, hmm, okay. Gathered here. Not a concentration camp, I'm sure, right? It's not anything heading towards that direction. Let's hope not. But I'd also read lots of really bad urban legends about the place, and I was a bit worried about what kind of horror show I'd find here. But of course, when we arrived, it was nothing like that. Or so it seems. <laughs> it was very clean, and decorated like a luxury hotel. Mayuri. Okarin. This way. Kare and Yuki waved to us as we entered the lobby. Yuki had gotten a message from Kare as well, and had evidently come right over. Where's Fubuki? She's fine. Yuki gave Mayuri a soft hug and a smile. Kare bowed her head apologetically. Sorry to scare you. I was kind of in a hurry myself. I should have checked more carefully before I messaged you. What do you mean? How's Nakase doing? I just met her mom in the hospital room, and it doesn't look like her illness has gotten any worse. Then they've just brought her here for more examinations or something? Yes. That's what they said. So there's nothing to worry about. Oh, I'm so glad. Mayeti looked extremely relieved as Yuki continued to hug her. If I remembered right, the last time they examined her, they said it was possible she had the disease, but as long as it didn't get any worse, it wouldn't affect her daily life. They just told her to come back for regular checkups. The new encephalitis had arrived in Japan over six months ago, but the number of patients was still increasing. <laughs> Fortunately, there hadn't been a single casualty yet. I'm pretty sure that's no illness, though. I was certain that 
what they were calling encephalitis was actually something similar to reading Steiner. One time when I went to visit Fubuki in the hospital, I had secretly investigated the other patients. I wasn't able to get any proof, but I found out most of the patients in her wing had, to varying degrees, memories of the same world line. Many people had memories of Japan at war. I'm surprised they're not calling it like mass hysteria, you know what I mean? I feel like that's usually the term that they would say. Like when everybody is believing something that isn't true all at the same time and it's causing a panic. I feel like that would be mass hysteria rather than like encephalitis, which sounds something more like a like a bacteria infection or something, you know what I mean? It's a weird thing. Although I don't know exactly what encephalitis is. I feel like I have an idea, but I don't technically know, so I might have to look that up later. Can we see Fabuki? They say they're doing an MRI to look at her brain right now, so she's not in her room. I see. But it'll be done soon. Fubuki's mom told us to wait here. Kade motioned to Mayuri, indicating she should sit down at a nearby sofa. Once the exam is done, she's going to come get us. I let the girls sit down on the sofa and stood next to them while I surveyed the lobby. This is an amazing hospital, isn't it? Y yeah. Is Nakase's family really rich or something? If she's staying in a place like this. No, that's not it. Fubuki's mom said that the Japanese and American governments are paying for a new treatment project. See, I don't like that. I don't like that. <laughs> what do you mean? Everyone's fine. They're just remembering different things, but they need a new treatment project. What do you mean? I don't know. I don't I don't like that. Wouldn't wouldn't the like natural thing to not be like, well, OK, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's see what the treatment plan is first. All right, let's see what that is. It's going to be centered around this lab, and a dedicated hospital in America, supposedly. I see. I wasn't sure how I felt about that. If I was right about what this disease really was, it was hard to imagine a bigger waste of money. Please, give all the patients private rooms. And try to keep the rooms as far apart from one another as possible to ensure the patients don't come into contact. But there aren't that many open rooms. You need to do it anyway. If the patients talk to each other, they'll start to share the dreams, right? Sure, that's true, but... Once a person hears about someone else's dream, their brain can trick them into thinking they had that dream as well. See, they're treating it like a bacteria- HUH?! HUH?! You're here?! I- I- I just- I didn't even know. That voice actually fit. I was just doing a, like, generic male voice. But it kinda fit. What are you doing here? Uh-uh. Uh-uh, is Maho here with you? Oh no, I don't like this. I don't like this. Across the lobby, I saw an old Japanese doctor in a white coat and a big man in a suit who was frantically trying to talk to him. Oh! I'd seen that man in the suit before. Actually, it was a man I knew well. P professor Professor Leskinen! I hurried over. Dr. Leskinen! It's me! Okabe! He must have been wearing his translator because he was communicating with the old doctor in Japanese. Dr. Leskinen's face quickly broke into a smile when he saw me. Oh! Lintaro! His voice was so loud that everyone in the lobby, doctors, nurses, staff, and even the patients turned to look at me. 
but Dr. Leskinen didn't seem to notice them as he ran over. He was like a giant American football player racing for a touchdown. <laughs> what? Wait, Professor! Stop! Stop! My cries went unheard as Dr. Leskinen tackled me and then pulled me up. Then he switched from football player to pro wrestler, and he swung me up and down. <laughs> I felt like I was a little child. There was nothing I could do to resist him as he flung me around. A moment later, he noticed the cold stares of the people around us and finally released me. Oh my! I'm sorry! I was so surprised! I got a little too excited. Dr. Leskinen bowed to the people around him in apology. Dr. Leskinen, who is this young man? The doctor at Professor Leskinen. The doctor that Professor Leskinen had been talking to was staring at me suspiciously. Oh, I'm... Well... I wasn't sure exactly what to tell him. It wasn't like he was really my professor. You seem to be a student. Which school are you with? If you're studying brain science like the professor... No, I I'm... He'll be a student at Victor Condria in September. I'm planning on having him come to my lab. Huh? <laughs> I see. Victor Condria University, huh? That's a surprise. I looked over at Dr. Leskinen questioningly, but he just gave me a mischievous smile. This guy... He really was such a kid. It's very rare for a Japanese student to be able to go there. I'm impressed. Th thanks. <laughs> After the doctor left, I sighed loudly enough for Professor Leskinen to hear me. <sighs> so, who was that guy? The director of this hospital. The director? You just told a lie to someone that important? Oh? Did I lie? I said you'd be a student starting in September, but I didn't mean this September. <laughs> or what? Do you think you don't have what it takes to make it to my school in the end? That's a little unfortunate, but... He really was like a little kid. Completely shameless. <laughs> I don't trust you, I want to laugh, but, but I don't trust you! But still, it was hard to hate him. I'm surprised though. I had no idea you were in Japan. It had been five months since I'd seen him off at Narita. Maho's here too. Really? She didn't say a word about it. I talked to her often via email and video chat, mostly about Amadeus's testing, but she hadn't said a word about coming to Japan. I hadn't heard anything about it from Kuditz either. We're back in the same office at Wako City. Come by any time you like, and bring credits. I told them to find us a different place after we got robbed last time, but... Dr. Leskinen looked up toward the ceiling and shrugged. It did feel like that place had security issues. Are you not feeling well, Lintalo? Did you come here for treatment? Oh, no. I'm here to visit a friend. Oh, I see. That's good. Well, it's not good for your friend. I'm sorry. Oh, no. So, what are you doing at a Japanese hospital? Dr. Leskinen brought his face close to mine and whispered so that the people around us couldn't hear him. You've heard about the new encephalitis cases, right? The American government asked our psychophysiology lab to look into it. 
but they've hit a roadblock. The university ordered me to help with the investigation. I see. So you're helping with the new encephalitis cases. Now there was a word I didn't expect to hear. I explained that my friend was here because they thought she might have the disease. Is your friend named Katsume Nakase, perhaps? Oh, yeah. You met her at the Christmas party, didn't you? That's right. My interest in this new disease started with that party, you see. Both you and Katsumi collapsed, right? He was right, actually. Okay, I'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt. I don't trust him, but I'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt. Was he talking to Reyes because, they, because of what he saw at the party and he wanted to figure out what was going on with the disease, so he's trying to get information out of Okabe that Okabe's not just willing to share? Is that it? So it's like a conniving way to try to do good rather than evil? I'm st He's still a bad guy to me. He's still a bad guy. In my case, I'd been sent to that other world line. I met up with her again several days ago. She demanded to know why she was being sent back to the hospital when she was just fine. I, I see. Would you tell her it would make me happy if she was a bit more cooperative? Huh. I actually feel pretty bad for both her and all the other patients. We in the Japanese team are doing what we can, but we just don't understand the results we're getting. Dr. Leskinen's usually chipper expression darkened. The man was such a ball of vitality that I hadn't noticed until then, but when his smile disappeared, I could see the wrinkles that had formed on his face from exhaustion. He must have been working hard, like he said. To be honest, none of the doctors thought we'd have this much trouble explaining it at the start. <laughs> hmm? What's wrong, Lintolo? Oh, uh, well, is there something wrong? No. I'm not a medical student, so this is all outside my expertise. I was just about to tell him about my reading Steiner. But in the end, I couldn't. Yeah, it's better you don't. If my uninformed opinion was wrong, it could cost the encephalitis patients their lives. I couldn't just tell him when I didn't have any proof. And then his face drew close to mine again. By the way, Katsumi was saying something very interesting. Huh? She said something about not being sick, about how she was actually experiencing another world in her dreams. Uh... I told her not to say anything about it. Could she not help it? This was bad. They might start to doubt her sanity. Well, Nakase's got a very vivid imagination, maybe. She loves sci-fi and anime. She probably just said she has the power to experience parallel worlds because she saw it on some show somewhere. He didn't say parallel worlds! Oh no, did he just out himself? I remember that I used to say stuff like that. <laughs> I tried my best to come up with excuses, but Dr. Leskinen still seemed concerned. But still, I was really surprised when I started participating in the treatment project. One of the strange things about this illness is that many patients share the same dreams. I'm assuming it's similar to a mass hallucination. I was saying mass hysteria, but yeah. But what do you think? I've never seen this before. From a brain science perspective, I just don't have an answer right now.
To be honest, unscientific is the word that seems to best fit. Like parallel worlds, or memories of a past life, you know. I see. It would help if you talked to Katsumi, too. There are some things you can't say to a doctor, but that you'll tell your friends. What, they bugger or something so that we can hear? Or so that they can hear, I mean? Sure. I'll ask her, I guess. So, Lintolo. That aside, I have a question for you. It's gonna be about Maho. Dr. Leskinen was looking over my shoulder. I got a sense of this at the Christmas party. But your girlfriends really are cute, aren't they? <laughs> uh... Huh? <laughs> I turned around and saw that Mayuri, Kare, and Yuki had all stood up from the sofa and were looking at me. When they saw Dr. Leskinen was looking at them, they waved. So, are any of those girls involved with you right now? Yuki? Kare? Mayuri? Luka? Or maybe Katsumi? What? <laughs> His words were so surprising I couldn't think of anything to say. Maho would often call this middle-aged man a mischievous boy, and that was exactly the look he had on his face. No, I won't force you to tell me. I don't want to pry into your private life. But, well, I'd hope to have something to tell my favorite student. <laughs> huh? Dr. Luskinen turned to walk away before I could figure out what he meant. All right, Lintolo. Now I've got to talk to the director a little more, so I'll be going. I'd love to go around to all those girls and give them a hug too, but I'll save that for next time. Tell them I said hello. Oh, sure. Mayuri and the others came over to me as I watched him go. I love how they characterize, like, an American person as just someone who wants to give hugs all the time. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really funny. Oh, man. I wonder if they have that issue over there where, like, foreign people, like, we'll say from America, just always want to give hugs, and they're like, dude, get the frick away from me. <laughs> Was that Dr. Leskinen? Yeah, I knew I'd seen him somewhere before. I thought he'd gone back to America. Ha! Ha ha! Oh, Karim? There was no way I could tell these girls what Dr. Leskinen and I were just talking about. <laughs> After Fubuki's exam was over, we went to her room and listened to her complain and then the visit was over. Just like Dr. Leskinen had said, she looked just fine. She told us she was ready to leave the hospital and jog all the way home. Mayuri and the others were relieved, but I felt worried. Did I need to talk to Dr. Leskinen about reading Steiner after all? But how would I explain it? It might be a better idea to talk to Maho and have her explain it to him. No, she's a spy now, dude. I couldn't come to an answer right away. All right, back to Suzaha. Huh? It was a very hot day in 1998 when Suzaha said goodbye to Kagari Shina. She'd gone to get food and water from a local store, and when she'd come back and opened the hatch... Kagari was inside, screaming. Oh, come on! How does this stupid thing work? She looked inside and saw that Kagari was slamming her tiny hands down on the control console. Oh! What are you doing? Ah! Uh. Kagari shrank back back when she saw Suzaha. I, I'm not. This isn't what it looks like. 
answer me. But... But... I woke up and you were gone. And it was dark and the lights won't turn on. And it's so cramped and scary in here. So I tried to open the door. And then when I was fiddling with it, this happened. Kagari started to cry. I'm sorry, Big Sis Suzaha. I'm sorry. But I was really scared. I see. Suzaha relaxed her guard. Kagari had PTSD from her time as a war orphan, and she hadn't fully recovered yet. Mayuri had once told her that she got very frightened in dark and cramped places. It would make sense if waking up in the dark caused a panic attack. And the time machine could only function with Suzaha's biometric authorization. Someone of Kagari's size wouldn't be able to break the console either. You passed out from the shock of time travel, so I wanted to let you get some rest. I'm sorry. Suzaha grabbed one of Kagari's tiny hands to help her up, and then led her outside the machine. Wow. It's so hot. Kagari. Promise me that you won't touch the switches on the control console no matter what, okay? Uh, uh, okay. I'm going to get started. You go and rest. Have some food and water if you want. Suzaha handed Kagari the provisions she'd brought, then went inside and poked her head into the cargo space under the control console. She connected the IBM 5100 she'd stored there to a portable terminal she'd bought from the future, or that she'd brought from the future. By all appearances, it was an early 2000s cell phone, but inside it was a miniaturized quantum computer from the year 2036. Of course, future Daru had made it himself. When she booted up the IBM 5100, rows of numbers started to appear on the screen. What are you doing? Kagari was looking in from outside the machine. Did you study the year 2000 problem? I studied it a little at the orphanage. In the end, nothing happened, right? That's what everybody thinks. It wasn't made public, but at the time, a lot of places and a lot of countries had serious problems because of it. Really? The issue was this computer, the IBM 5100. It's got an old programming language on it, and the engineers weren't able to fix the program. In fact, they didn't even know that an important program existed that was written in this language. The race to develop the time machine was the beginning of the Third World War, but there's a chance that something had happened during the year 2000 problems, and the divisions that resulted from that were a deeper cause. She didn't expect a ten-year-old like Kagari to understand this, but she didn't feel like taking the time to explain. And the year 2000 is a special year, you see. All of the world lines temporarily converge here. This means that it's possible the year 2000 problem has a huge effect on all the world lines. The world line in the gap that we're trying to reach, Steins Gate, is no exception. She looked down at the terminal connected to the IBM 5100. So this is a patch program to keep the year 2000 problem from ever happening. Oh, really? What is it, like a... 
like a how do you how, how does it stop that from happening it's got to interfere with time time right i mean it's a i guess it's a quantum thing so huh right now the terminal was converting the patch into the language used by the ibm 5100 the next step was to spread this program all around the world in the form of a virus and the year 2000 problems that this era's engineers missed would completely disappear. Oh. The word connect appeared on the terminal's subscreen. So she's trying to fix it from happening so that it doesn't happen. Interesting. Okay, it's connected. She'd been told that in Japan in this era, ADSL was still in the test phase, and most normal users connected to the internet by low-speed dial-up using ISDN. But in major city areas like Akihabara, universities, labs, and some big computer companies were starting to use fiber-optic broadband. Some of them were even using wireless LANs. Suzaha cracked her way into one of those. Dad had laughed when he'd said that with 2036 technology, cracking late 20th century network security was a joke. But he'd been right. B but if you change the future, won't that change the world we were in? Surprisingly, Kagari had gotten the gist of what Suzaha had just told her. That's right. I refuse to let that world exist any longer. So I've come here to reach Steinsgate. <sighs> Suddenly, the uneasy look in Kagari's face vanished. It was as if her soul had left her body. Suddenly, her face was expressionless, and her eyes were wide. Boys, I can hear God's voice. Kagari? You can't do that. It's not right. You can't do that, Big Sis Suzaha. You can't. Huh? Kagari was acting strangely. Suspiciously, Suzaha reached her hand out towards her. Is this where she's gonna, like, pull out? She's gonna, like, take Suzaha's gun? But... She slipped past Suzaha's hand. And quicker than any child should be able to move, she slammed her shoulder straight into Suzaha's body. Did she just get, like... Wait, she said she heard the voice of God. Did she just, like, get, uh, uh, time leapt into or something? Did that happen? Uh? Suzaha was caught completely off guard. That's how fast it was. Kagari's shoulder hit her in the solar plexus. Blah! She bent over and collapsed onto the seat. Kagari tore the terminal out of Suzaha's hands. The cables connecting it to the IBM 5100 were ripped out and errors displayed on both screens. Well, what are you doing? Kagari didn't answer the question. Instead, she grabbed the backpack that Suzaha had placed on the seat and spilled its contents onto the floor. There were MREs, spare parts, clothes, and a semi-automatic pistol. Suzaha couldn't believe it. Kagari was going to try and pick it up. Stop it! She forced herself to ignore the pain as she jumped on Kagari's body. But another unbelievably powerful body slam knocked her back. That's not her. Uh. <laughs> Something cold was pushed right up against her brow. 
don't move! Kagari's tiny hands weren't shaking at all as they clutched the semi-automatic pistol. In the space of an instant, the safety on the gun had been flipped off. That's when Suzuha realized that this wasn't just a temper tantrum. Suzuha was the one who taught her how to use a gun. That's why she knew that Kagari was perfectly calm. Are you insane? Put the gun down, now! Stop doing this! You're the one who needs to stop! What? You can't change the world! You're not making sense! There was no hesitation in her eyes. Instead, Suzuha saw only resolve. Do you want the war to happen then? I don't know anything about that! I just want to go back to my old world! Then, that's never going to happen. We've already used the time machine to interfere with the past. The world lines changed. There's almost no chance we can go back. Shut up! Shut up! I'm going to save Mommy! You can't erase this world! I won't let you! Kagari turned the gun towards the IBM 5100. S stop Oh no. Before Suzuha could stop her, she yanked down on the trigger. Again. And again. Stop it, Kagari! Please stop! And then Kagari jumped out of the time machine. And Suzuha never saw her again. Yo, dude! She got time left into. That's what happened. It said she went expressionless and everything. She said she heard the voice of God. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Nah, something happened there. Had to know, right? Like, it... it it wasn't just her. I mean, she said that she taught her how to use the gun, but she said she was quick, and, like, she knew how to hit her, obviously. She hit her in the solar plexus. It's like... Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> On every night that passed, she remembered Kagari. Suzaha had spent some time looking for Kagari when she'd first come to this era, but in the end, she'd never found anything. But Kagari Shina, who was now 22 years old, was here in Akihabara. Oh, wait, she would be 22. Yeah, because she left her in 98, so she can't be her mom. She can't be Kuditz's mom. Oh, no. So uh, that can't be right. I thought for sure. I mean, she looks just like her. Huh. Man, now I don't know. Unless Kagari somehow figured out how to go back in time again. Oh, no. Okay. Suzaha was sure of it. But it did no good to keep thinking about it. So Suzaha decided to stop thinking and look around the room. Iteru, her dad, was playing yet another game populated entirely with female characters. What the heck is he wearing? What is that? His jaw was slack and he was scratching his belly fat that stuck out from under his shirt as he played. There wasn't much to respect in him right now, either as a father or as a person. <laughs> Come to think of it, how are things with Mom? Hmm? Is everything okay? I'm still going to be born, right? <laughs> oh. Well, is that more important 
than the time machine? Hey! <laughs> Suzaha stormed over to Itaru. You can't screw this up, Dad! Y yeah. Daddy's gonna do his best, okay? <laughs> All you ever do is talk. You even wasted those movie tickets we gave you, didn't you? Aw, oh, no! She meant the pair of movie tickets that Mayuri and Faris had conspired to give them at the Christmas party. Th that was because Okarin and Miss Fubuki collapsed, you know? We were so busy with hospital visits and stuff that the movie left the theater. It's not like it's my fault. But I heard that when they tried to give you new tickets, you turned them down. Who, who told you that? Big Sis Mayu and Big Sis Dumi, obviously. Th that's because... You know! It's not very manly to make those two do all the work, is it? <laughs> so, did you go and do something yourself? <laughs> this isn't going to work. Maybe this was a more important problem than the time machine. Suzaha brought her hands up to her head. Listen, Dad. I'm not going to be around to lecture you like this forever, okay? I'm leaving soon. Oh. Suddenly... There was a sad look in Itaru's eyes. Don't make that face. I promised I'd stop worrying about it. For the past six months, Suzaha had been thinking about whether it was really right to erase this world. But in the end, it was none other than Itaru who'd pushed her to go ahead. I'm sorry. She couldn't bear to see her father so depressed, so she patted his broad back. Don't just sit there and be glum. Send Mom a message, and see if she's free sometime. And if she is, invite her to a movie. <gasps> That's way too sudden. I don't care if it's sudden or not. Do it anyway, okay? This is an order. Uh, an order? What's your answer? Sir, yes, sir! <laughs> Satisfied, she'd headed off to take a shower. Oh, but before that, I'm going to hit the convenience store. Uh, don't glare at me like that. I'll eat as healthy as I can, so please forgive me. Vanilla. Huh? I want ice cream when I'm done with my shower. Vanilla ice cream. <laughs> okay. I'll go buy you a lot of really top shelf stuff. It doesn't have to be a lot. Just one thing is fine. Sir, yes, sir! <laughs> that was enough to cheer Daru up. He took his wallet and ran out of the lab. He's such a handful. <laughs> she had just about taken off her jacket so she could take that shower. But... Suzaha! Itaru had come back into the lab. What is it? I found this on the stairs. Oh, what? Wait. No. My Yeti had the same thing, right? So, it could either be her or Kagari. It's one of the two. Itaru showed her a keychain he was holding. It was a round anime character 
whose color had faded to a smoky green. It was an upa. Do you know whose this is? Big Sis Mayus, probably? She leaned forward to take a closer look, and then she felt like she was experiencing deja vu. I've seen this upa somewhere before. She'd seen it before? She couldn't really remember when. But her internal alarms were going off. This keychain was extremely important. Uh. Upas were common enough that you could find them anywhere. The plastic edges had worn down. The paint was faded and coming off in places. But there was no dust, and there was no stains. Instead, it shone brightly, as if its owner had put a lot of effort into taking good care of it. Yup, yup, it's, it's Kagari's for sure. The chain was so old that part of it had snapped off. That was probably how it got dropped. Oh, so she was there. Where was it? I've seen this before. Did Mayushi show it to you? I don't know. She stared at the green upa in Itaru's hands. And then, in her mind, she heard a young girl scream. Ah. Uh. This is Mommy's upa keychain. I'm giving it to you. Take good care of it, okay? <laughs> she gasped. A feeling of indescribable terror raced down her spine. This can't be... Kakari's? That was when she'd last seen it. August 13th, 2036. The day she'd gone into the time machine. That's when she'd seen this upa. It was older and more worn down now. But the more she remembered that day, the more certain she became. This was the upa that Mayeri had given to Kagari. She'd seen Kagari holding it and crying to herself many times before. Kagari? You mean future Miss Mayu's daughter? Yeah. Did you find her? No, but she knows where I am. Wh what do you mean? She's watching this lab. Yeah, what the heck. Satisfied, she headed off to take a shower. Ever since then, her careful efforts to defend the time machine had paid off, and she hadn't seen any sign of Kagari. But she never thought she'd be watching the lab. <gasps> I bet she was the one that was spying on her in Forest, right? And then sped off? It said that she was that the, the, the person was trained though, but like, she said that uh, Suzaha like had it said that Suzaha trained her to use the gun, right? So maybe she taught her tactics, and that's how she knew to like throw the object down that tripped her, and made her fall down the stairs. Remember? I bet it was Kagari, dude. Yo, is she around her now, dude? No, oh, dude, oh, frick, I'm pretty sure it's her. It's gotta be, right? Because she's worried about the time machine, so it makes sense that she would be spying on it now. Oh, no. No. It would have been obvious if I'd given it any thought. She's trying to stop us from reaching Stein's Gate. She doesn't want this world to end. Which means she's watching not just me, but you too. 
Huh? Me? Well, I don't think your life is in danger. Probably. If you believe what we know about how world lines work, you live till at least 2036. But she might come to interfere with your research, so we can't reach Steins Gate. A lot of bad things had been happening around Suzaha, Itaru, and Dintaro Okabe. There was some possibility that the final target was Itaru. From now on, just to be safe, lock the door whenever I'm not around. Oh, uh, okay. Got it. Even if Uncle Okarin, Mom, or Big Sis Mayu are here, don't leave it open. It might not help much, but make sure you use the door chain, too. You know, Okarin and Mayushi are one thing, but if I did that when I was alone with Amaneshi, don't you think that'd give her the wrong idea? Ah, uh, that's true. <laughs> if that makes her not like me, my whole family could be in trouble. Suzaha groaned softly, unsure of what to do. If you'd only gotten to be her boyfriend sooner, there wouldn't be a problem. Wait, we're back to that? Just be careful, okay? Suzaha decided to keep the green Upa keychain. She softly ran her fingertips over it as she stared at it. Hey, Suzaha. Kagaritan's not related to Mayushi, but she's still her daughter, right? That's right. Could somebody raised by Mayushi grow up to be the kind of person who'd assault someone? <laughs> I just can't imagine it, from what you've told me. I'd expect her to be a kind, easygoing, and cute little girl. I wish that was what had happened. Yeah, I thought that was how she'd turn out too. But now, she's probably... From what she'd seen at the radio building, she could tell. Kagari had definitely received professional combat training. Oh, wait, so she she did put two and two together, so they are thinking it's Kagari, okay. It wasn't just the simple self-defense techniques that she'd learned from Suzaha when she was a child. As she'd grown up, she'd been taught the cold techniques of a killer. There was no way to know where she'd been, or what she'd been doing, ever since she'd gone missing in 1998. I guess she's probably part of CERN. She's probably a rounder, dude. But there was no doubt in Suzaha's mind that she was trying to ruin her plans. Suzaha sighed as she took her shower. Since it was summer, she'd set the water temperature low. It was barely any hotter than tap water. As long as the water was pouring down on her, she could feel like all the bad memories were being washed away. She slapped her cheeks with both hands and turned off the water. The small tiled room suddenly became quiet. In the silence, she vigorously toweled off her hair. This building was never intended for anyone to live in. Not only was there very little room, there wasn't even a place to change. It was small, and there were no windows, and the steam from the shower room built up, making it an unpleasant sauna in summer. Supposedly, Itaru and Okabe would sit naked next to the fans to get away from the heat and moisture. Of course, that was only when the girls, as well as Luka Urashibara, weren't around, <laughs> as well as Luka. But Suzaha couldn't do that. 
there were those huge scars on her chest. If she was careless and Yuki saw them, she'd have a big problem. So she always forced herself to change within this small space. Well, just lock the door, right? Isn't that what you said? That no one could just walk in on you? <laughs> the second she left the shower room, she realized something was wrong. The lights were off in the part behind the curtain, where the lab room was. She was sure she had left all the lab lights on when she'd gone to take a shower. She didn't remember turning them off. Still completely naked, she flung open the curtain. Oh no. <laughs> she dropped to the floor, ready to move. She could tell by the light from the shower room that there was no one else there. She didn't hear any breathing, and she didn't feel any other presence. Did Dad come back? And then when he'd left, he turned off the lights? No, that couldn't be right. She looked around the room and saw that things had been moved in a way that an amateur wouldn't be able to notice. Itaru's computer desk, the sofa area, the bookshelves, even the mini kitchen. Someone had gone through them all. From the look of it, the same was probably true of the development room. Suzuha glanced over all the areas where she kept her guns. The closest was the sofa that she used as a bed. I don't get why she didn't lock the door. That's... She just talked about it. It would make sense for, like, it to do not to. Like, if Yuki was there, maybe. Like, still kind of a stretch, but still. But, like, for... For Suzaha not to... I don't know, man. She'd wanted to have one easily available if she was attacked while she slept. So she had cut out the back of one of the sofa cushions and hidden a suppressed semi-automatic pistol in it. It was just a 32 caliber for self-defense, so it wouldn't do much damage unless you had good aim. But it was small and relatively quiet, which made it the best choice for a place like this. Suzaha tensed all of her muscles, coiling like a spring and slowly moved towards the sofa without making a sound. As she did, she tried to notice any changes in the surrounding area. There was a small sound in the development room. It was a tiny, tiny creaking of the floor, to which you'd usually pay no mind. But that was more than enough for Suzaha. It's not gonna actually be her, is it? In an instant, she moved from quiet to action, although she did say stuff moved, so I don't know. She cleared the distance to the sofa in an instant, and quickly drew her gun. She held it ready, and slipped into the shadow of the refrigerator. From this position, she could barely see into the development room. Oh, nope, it is someone! Oh no! The room became silent again. But this time, the intruder in the other room didn't try to hide their presence. Try anything and I'll shoot. Hands on your head. Come out slowly. Suzaha threatened the intruder in a low voice. But the intruder seemed completely unconcerned as they exposed themselves to Suzaha's gaze. Dude, is that the, the freaking, the, the freaking girl from the ra, -ra, -ra? <laughs> It's the, it's the freaking, uh, what did they call, what did they call her? It was the headless horseman, whatever the word for that is in, uh, what the, is it the, the Irish word or whatever? <laughs> hmm. He must be pretty hot wearing that in this weather. Why not at least take off your helmet? The intruder was wearing a motorcycle suit, just like before. Even the helmet was the same. 
The leather suit clung tight to their skin, revealing a voluptuous and perfectly proportioned body. It was clearly a woman. What you're looking for isn't there. It's in my pocket. Suzaha pointed toward the entrance to the shower room. The shirt she had just taken off was lying there on the floor. The girl in the motorcycle suit turned her head, but because the face mask was down, Suzaha couldn't read her expression. You should know better than to drop that. It's something Mommy gave you. Right, Kagari? Oh! The second she spoke, Kagari Shino was the first to move. <laughs> the way it comes to the fray, that was funny. She drew a deglossed military knife that she must have been hiding behind her back and closed the gap between herself and Suzuha in an instant. Suzaha pointed the gun at her legs and pulled the trigger, carefully aiming away from her vitals. She heard the small pop of a suppressed 32 and saw Kagari lose her balance and fall. Or she thought she did, but it was a feint. <laughs> She'd only pretended to lose her balance. In fact, she changed directions and was heading for the shower room. It seemed her first goal was to get what she'd come for. How trained do you have to be to get shot at and then faint the shot knowing that they're going to stop shooting at you so that you can then trick them and move in another direction? What kind of training prepares you for that? Huh? After firing only one shot, Suzaha realized even a 32 should have more recoil than this. Was it replaced? She fired again, but Kagari didn't flinch even for a moment. A blank? How? Yeah. At some point, all the bullets in Suzaha's gun had been swapped with blanks. Got you, okay. I was gonna say, how would you, like, freaking, you know, faint something like that? That instant's panic was all it took. You gotta get in rough and tumble, let's go! Kagari reached out for the shirt on the floor in front of the shower room. No way! Ooh! Suzaha gave up on firing and flung the gun at Kagari. <laughs> there was a dull thud as the hard barrel slammed into her neck. Caught off balance, she staggered before she could grab the shirt. She could hear Kagari's voice for the first time from within the helmet. Suzaha jumped. Ooh! She kicked the off-balance Kagari as hard as she could with her toned, muscled legs. This was no time to hold back. Ooh! Kagari went flying all the way to the edge of the room. That had to have broken a few ribs. Really? Dang! Suzaha jumped toward her to continue her attack. But with terrifying speed, Kagari leapt off the ground and charged at Suzaha. There wasn't enough time to come to a full stop. Hey! Oh! Ah! A sharp blade swept by, mere centimeters from her exposed abdomen. If she'd pulled back even a few tenths of a second later, the knife would have fatally sliced open her gut. You witch! The blood rushed to Suzaha's head. Kagari was serious. She was planning to kill her. There was no hesitation in her movements. Suzaha leapt back and searched for something she could use as a weapon. But the other guns were probably no different. There was a good chance they'd all had their ammo swapped with blanks, too. It was even possible that all her self-defense knives had been taken, too. That's, like, a lot of prep to then still be looking through the room. You know what I mean? To, like, replace everything, knowing that she might come out and attack you? Like, what? How did you do that? Which left 
Unless she'd done it before. There were several knives carefully stored in the kitchen. Yuki had brought them over to use in teaching the other girls how to cook. But Kagari had evidently noticed them as well, and she was moving to keep Suzaha from reaching them. Ha! Huh. Looks like you've had a lot of practice. It's hard to believe you're the same girl who spent all her time sobbing inside the time machine. I'm surprised. Suzaha kept her distance from Kagari as she slowly moved along the wall. Her competitive drive burned even brighter as she tried to come up with a way to overcome her disadvantage. Here, Kagari. This is what you're after, right? She picked up her shirt from in front of the shower room, and she took the green keychain out of its pockets. <laughs> What's wrong? Come get it. Her fingers moved as if to crush it. She could see Kagari twitch. For the first time, she could detect a hint of emotion behind the helmet. And in an instant, she threw it at Kagari's stomach. The keychain flew in a slow arc, like she was tossing it to a friend. If something they loved was thrown like that, even the fiercest warrior would instinctively reach out with both hands to grab it. Kagari was no exception. She carefully held her mother's memento in both her empty left hand and the right hand that still clutched the knife. Using the slow arc of the keychain as camouflage, Suzaha ran at her in a straight line. Ooh! Her right fist connected hard with Kagari's stomach. Then her left arm smashed Kagari's head to the side. <laughs> Kagari's body fell to the ground, her right shoulder taking the brunt of the fall. Suzaha could hear the sound of her joint dislocating. Ooh! No! The knife slipped from her grasp. Oh, crap. Oh, okay, all right. Suzaha got behind her and mounted her, twisting her right arm mercilessly. Okay, all right. At the same time, she slipped her own left arm around Kagari's neck and squeezed hard. She could hear something like a moan from Kagari's throat. She could both hear and feel the bones in her arm and neck creaking. Stay put. I'm not going to kill you. Dang, she's so cool. But Kagari picked up the knife on the floor with her left hand and once again tried to use it on Suzaha. Suzaha was forced to squeeze her arm and neck even harder. <laughs> Stop it, Kagari! I understand how you feel now, but it's wrong! It's wrong! But Kagari didn't stop. If anything, she tried even harder to pull Suzaha away. What, what kind of training did she get? Even in all the battles she'd been in, this much pressure on two different spots was enough to get even the toughest soldier to submit or fall unconscious. Terrified, Suzaha squeezed even harder. At this rate, she wouldn't simply knock her out. She really would kill Kagari. But if she stopped, Kagari would kill her. What should she do? Big says Suzaha. It hurts. It hurts. Don't fall for that crap. And then she heard a sad, weak voice from inside the helmet. Don't do it. It startled her. And she relaxed both her arms. No! But that was just what Kagari had hoped for. The knife came very close to cutting Suzaha's left arm. When she let go to dodge it, Kagari shook her off and kicked at her hips with both legs. Ugh! 
Suzaha was slammed back hard into the co computer desk, and for a moment, she couldn't breathe. She fell to the floor, and the printer and monitor crashed mercilessly into her naked body. She forced herself to stand up, gasping hard as she did so. Kagari's breath was heavy too. Her right arm was pointed in an impossible direction, and hanging limp. Ew. She wouldn't be able to use it for a while, probably. But her left arm was still holding the knife. You've learned some dirty tricks, haven't you? Suzaha glared at Kagari's face. Not that she could see what it looked like behind the, that helmet. <laughs> the two of them fell silent as they tried to catch their breath. The tension in the air was so thick that it was difficult to move a muscle. Sweat rolled down her forehead and into her eyes, but she still didn't blink as she waited for Kagari to make her next move. It was the sound of the front door opening that broke their stalemate. Oh no! Is it gonna be my Yeti? Oh no! It's Daru! Hey, Suzaha? Did I just hear a loud noise? Suzaha felt a chill run down her spine when she heard Itaru's voice. Huh? Why is it so dark? No, Dad! Stay back! Oh crap! She yelled at the exact same instant he turned on the lights. The sudden brightness was enough to make Suzaha flinch for an instant. Kagari was wearing a full face helmet, and that made all the difference. She leapt towards Itaru just a moment before Suzaha. What? Kagari's black knife went up to his throat. Dad! <laughs> Kagari spun around behind him, using Itaru's huge body as a shield. Suzaha staggered toward him, gritting her teeth. Let go, Kagari. <laughs> Lay one finger on Dad, and I don't care who you are, Kagari. I'll kill you. But Kagari remained silent as she headed outside the door with her hostage. And then in the next moment, she shoved him forward. Uh! Itaru lost his balance and fell towards Suzaha. Suzaha fell to the ground underneath his weight. Itaru just barely managed to support himself with his arms and legs to keep from crushing her. Move! Suzaha tried to shove him off, using a little more force than she may have in intended. But Itaru was so huge, it would take him a moment to get up. This is why I told you to lose weight! <laughs> what? She was getting away. She somehow managed to crawl out from under him, and quickly tried to follow after Kagari. Suzaha, wear this! Itaru was still lying on the ground as he tossed the naked Suzaha her shirt. She grabbed it and quickly put it on and ran outside. <laughs> but when she looked around the street, the girl in the motorcycle leathers wasn't there. There was no way to even know where she'd gone. She got away. It would be dangerous to run around trying to find her now. There was a chance Itaru would be attacked while she wasn't at the lab. W was that... Kagari-tan? Itaru came outside as well. Yeah. I'm almost certain. I see. <laughs> it's 
So this is how it's going to be with the two of us in the end. The bruises and wounds were bad enough, but the pain that ached in her heart was the worst of all. You know, I... I really did like her. Yeah. She was small, but so brave. And she always did her best to protect Big Sis Mayu. And I taught her a lot. I thought of her as like... A little sister. Yeah. But now... She's completely my enemy. Itaru straightened up her shirt sleeves. You know, you look like a <coughs> girl in an H game right now, Suzaha. Huh? What? Suzaha was caught completely off guard. True, her t-shirt only came down to just below her hips, roughly the length of a miniskirt. Her breasts were almost completely bared. Okay, alright, come on, man. The shirt's hem was turned up, and she felt exposed. Well, I don't mind H games with <coughs> girls, and I don't think the whole naked except for a t-shirt thing is all that bad. <laughs> You're being silly again. You could have gotten badly hurt. Uh, yeah, no, it's more than silly. It's more than silly. But sure. <laughs> but Ituru shook his head. I got freaked out by the knife, but I don't think I really needed to be that scared. Unless I'm mistaken. Ituru rubbed the part of his neck where the knife blade was. When she had the knife to my throat, I could hear it. Just a little. Hear what? She was probably... crying. Huh? Aw. Crying? Under that helmet? After the whole battle with Suzaha? While holding a knife to Itaru's neck? I mean, she did break her arm, so... <laughs> I mean... But why? Obviously, that's not what they're going for. I'm just saying, that's a reason to cry. So don't you think it's too early to jump to conclusions? Dad. Hmm? Did you buy me that vanilla ice cream? Yeah, of course. I'd love to eat it. I'm a little... tired. And then she almost fell forward. What? Itaru managed to catch her before she hit the ground. What the heck? Hey! Hey, Suzaha? Mm, I'm fine. But let me rest a little. That was all she had the energy to say. She closed her eyes in her dad's arms. And her consciousness melted away.